Well, as normal, we're going to begin with a quiz. It's quite a, a simple quiz. Uh, last week, we went through chapters 4, 5, and 6. However, this is just a short quiz, and I think you will find it quite easy. So let's go to the revision quiz. This is taken from the end of Hebrews chapter 4. The throne of God is a throne of what? And here we have a five-letter word. And question number two. There remains a something for the people of God. What is the answer? It's a four-letter word. And question number three. Uh, we have a high priest who is able to sympathize with our what? Something that we have many of. What's the answer here? Ten letter word. And question number four. Uh, Jesus is the something of eternal salvation to those who something, something. So here we have a, a word that is six letters and a word that is four letters. Uh, sorry, my phone just went and I dropped it. I'm not quite sure whether someone was saying whether they cannot hear me. Um, okay, please indicate if there's a problem with the sound. Uh, so let's now uh, go in to the answers to the revision quiz. The answer to the revision quiz is this. The throne of God is a throne of, and here's the answer, the word grace. I think that's a wonderful thought. Sometimes we think the throne of God is all to do with judgment, and of course there is judgment, but grace before judgment. Lovely thought. Question number two. There remains a something for the people of God, and um, the answer is the word rest. Question number three. We have a high priest who is able to sympathize with our, here's the answer, the word is weaknesses. And question number four, Jesus says the six-letter word here is source. Jesus is the source of eternal salvation to those who, and here's the four-letter word, obey him. Uh, so there were five answers there tonight, even though there were four questions. Uh, and if you give yourself, I guess, 20% uh, for each answer, you could have 100% or 80% or 60% or less. Don't worry again. It's just a simple revision quiz. quiz. It's not a, a major test in any way, shape or form. So tonight we're going to look into uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 7. Sometimes this particular book is missed. This chapter is uh, regarded as a discussion on the story of Melchizedek. But of course, it is a continuing story of Jesus Christ. And Melchizedek is mentioned, but this is not the mystery of Melchizedek explained. This is the continuing story of who Jesus is. And we'll get to the story of how Melchizedek links in to that in just a few moments. Let's go first of all to the New Testament. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 22, verses 41 and 45. Uh, here Matthew records in his Gospel a discussion that Christ is having with the Pharisees. And this links, in, links into Hebrews 7 in a few moments, as you'll see. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, what do you think about the Christ? And of course the word here is the Messiah. What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. And then Jesus said to them, How is it then that David, in the Spirit, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, calls him, the Messiah, Lord, saying, The Lord has said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I put your enemies under 
your feet. So he's quoting here from Psalm 110. Then he says to the Pharisees, If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? So he poses a question here. And this is all to do with the divinity of Jesus Christ. Let's go to Psalm 110, where we'll see the quotation is taken from, from this Psalm 110. This is 110 Psalm, verses 1 and 4, and then we'll be going to Hebrews 7 and 15. You'll see how it links in here. It says the Lord, and here we have uh, the Hebrew word Yahweh, talking of God. The Lord says to my, that is David's Lord, and here we have uh, another Hebrew word, uh, A-D-O-N-I, not A-D-O-N-A-I, it's not in the plural, just the singular superior Lord, says to my Lord, the Messiah that is, the Son, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. This is a reference to the idea of the divinity of Jesus Christ. Jesus is David's Lord, and Yahweh says to David's Lord, uh, who is, of course, the Messiah and the Son, uh, sit at my right hand. And then it says in verse 4, something very curious indeed. The Lord has sworn, that is, Yahweh has sworn, and will not change his mind. Nothing's going to change what this is. You, the Son, that is, uh, the Adoni or Adon, you, the Son, are a priest forever after the order of... Now, this is interesting, isn't it? Because chances are people who would read this psalm would think that the next word would be Aaron or even Levi because they understood that the, the priest came from uh, the lineage of Aaron, and of course the connection there to uh, Levi as well. But it doesn't say that. It says Melchizedek. And this is a bit of a surprise. This is something quite unusual. And, and of course we know from Hebrews chapter 7, which we're about to read, and in verse 15, it says another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek. What is this exactly talking about? Well, we're going to discuss this in more detail tonight and the relevance of it. But not what it said as we just look at that scripture there in Psalm 110. It says, after the order of Melchizedek. There are different ways that, of interpreting this phrase, after the order of. It could be after the model of, or it could be in succession to. Someone who is a success successor to the priesthood of Melchizedek. This would have been a shock, as I mentioned, to those who would have read Psalm 110, because they would have been familiar with, with Aaron and with the Levitical priesthood. So how come it is Melchizedek, or Melchizedek rather? What is, what is the explanation of that? Before we go fully into it, let's remember something about the movement of the, in the book of Hebrews. Where has the book of Hebrews been taking us to? What is the progressive movement within the passage the passages that we have been reading. Well, let's remember we have understood that Jesus is more. Jesus is superior to us, but he became one of us. And of course, we call that the incarnation. And Jesus is also superior to the fathers of the Old Testament. And Jesus is superior to the prophets and to the angels and to Moses, and to other servants of God. We've read that so far in our studies. 
And tonight we're going to see that Jesus is also superior to Abraham and to Aaron and to the Levitical priests. This is all still discussing who Jesus is and how Jesus is more. We've already seen that Jesus is the Son sent by God. Jesus is incarnate, the begotten Son of God, made flesh for us. And Jesus is the very image of God's essence. And also we read that Jesus is the creator, the saviour, the upholder, the founder of our faith. These are all by way of revision of some of the things we have been discussing already. And tonight we'll see that Jesus is also the high priest appointed by God. Therefore, and there's a big therefore, uh, come with me to Hebrews 5 and verses 5 to 6. Therefore, uh, Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but he was appointed by him who said to him, and this is again quotation from, a quotation from Psalm 110, Psalm 110, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And uh, it says also in Psalm 110, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This is actually quoting from two separate Psalms. The first quote is not from Psalm 110, but we have seen that Jesus is God's begotten Son, and Jesus is God's appointed priest. We also read uh, last week in Hebrews 6, verses 19 to 20, uh, that we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. And that whole thought there is to do with atonement. And this is the introduction to the subject of atonement within the book of Hebrews. Where Jesus has gone as a forerunner, who has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So we can see, and we saw it last week, that atonement was introduced and also Melchizedek is introduced. But why Melchizedek? Let's remember still about the contents of Hebrews chapter 7, which we're about to read. I'm going to summarize the contents before we get to the reading of it. So Hebrews 7 is still about Jesus. Once again, the focus is not about Melchizedek. As some people have misunderstood that. Hebrews is constantly talking about who Jesus is and how that relates to us and to our salvation. We will see, as we read Hebrews 7, that the Levitical order is contrasted to the order of Melchizedek. Two concepts of priesthood here. The Levitical order and the order of Melchizedek. And there's a contrast being made. Remember that word contrast. It's important in our study of the book of Hebrews. And the contrast is this. If we look at the Levitical priesthood, it had a, a clear lineage. We knew, or the Levites knew, uh, who they could trace themselves back to. The priestly lineage. And also, the Levitical priesthood was ordained within the way the law said that they should be ordained. There's a clear stipulation in the law. And the Levitical priesthood, as we'll see in this contrast, ended with Jesus Christ. However, when we come to Melchizedek, uh, in contrast to the Levitical priesthood, there's no priestly lineage. You cannot trace Melchizedek's priesthood back to someone else. 
Also with the priesthood of Melchizedek, there's not an ordained way uh, within the Mosaic law that would account for his ordination. In fact, Melchizedek was not ordained within the Mosaic law. And when it comes to Melchizedek, his priesthood has not come to an end with Christ. Rather, the priesthood of the order of Melchizedek continues in Christ. As we'll see in Hebrews chapter 7, there is an and. Uh, there's more things to say about Hebrews 7. Melchizedek is contrasted to Abraham in Hebrews chapter 7. Uh, we will see that Melchizedek blesses Abraham and also Melchizedek receives tithes from Abraham. But when we look at Abraham or Abram as he was at the time, uh, Abram is the one from whom the Levites are descended, and he is blessed by Melchizedek. Therefore, who is superior, one could ask? Well, the answer is, Melchizedek appears to be superior to Abram, because Abram also gives tithes to Melchizedek. And all this we're about to read, but I wanted to summarize it beforehand so when we get there we can identify what we're talking about more. So the question is going to be in Hebrews chapter 7. Therefore, uh, which is the superior priesthood? Is, is it the temporary Levitical order? Is that the superior priesthood? Or is it the order of Melchizedek, who, by the way, uh, his name is interpreted as king of righteousness, and who also was the king of Salem, meaning king of peace? So the answer to the question, which is the superior priesthood? And this question is posed by Hebrews chapter 7. The answer is the eternal priesthood of Melchizedek. And we will see that Jesus is appointed by God as a priest after that order, the order of Melchizedek. And we'll see that Jesus is like Melchizedek, but he is more than Melchizedek. So let's continue by remembering something about Melchizedek. We're going to turn to Genesis chapter 14 as a introduction, a uh, further introduction to what we're about to read. In Genesis chapter 14, there is a huge battle that takes place. Many uh, people who study the, the language of the Bible think that Genesis chapter 14 is probably the chapter of the Bible that contains the oldest style of language. And it has a lot of historicity that seems to verify the accounts, that the historicity means that within the setting of the description of Genesis chapter 14, it's possible that these things could have happened. Perhaps you remember the story. I'm just summarizing it for you now, because it's relevant as we look at Hebrews chapter 7. Remember that Abram's nephew, who was called Lot, had separated from Abram and settled in the better place, at least thought, at least Lot thought it was a better place, settled near the city of Sodom. In Genesis chapter 14, four great kings invade Sodom uh, and Gomorrah and the surrounding areas, and these four great kings take Abram's nephew Lot captive. Abram decides to rescue his nephew. And he leads an army against the invaders. He defeats them and he rescues Lot and in so doing liberates the city of Sodom. Uh, Sodom had its own king. And so the king of Sodom, after this liberation, meets a, a rides out to meet Abram. Uh, we don't know whether he is riding out in a hostile way or perhaps he's afraid. What is Abram going to be like? And then this 
person, Melchizedek, appears. This is Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 to 20. Again reading from the English Standard Version. It says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. I always love this particular passage. Now, sometimes I, we have so many scenarios about the end time. Who knows really what's going to happen? We, so many speculations. But wouldn't it be a beautiful image if at the end of days Jesus is coming to us after the order of Melchizedek? And what is Jesus bringing to us? Bread and wine. The symbols of his communion and union with us. Anyway, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. This is fascinating. We, perhaps sometimes we think we are the, the only people whom God has called. I wonder what Abram thought. Did he realize that God had been working with someone else, someone unknown to Abram? And here we find this man, Melchizedek. Not only has God been working with Melchizedek, but it ends up being that he, this Melchizedek, he was a priest of God Most High. Melchizedek had responded to the call of God and had become a priest. And he, talking of um, Melchizedek, blessed him and said, blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High. So here we find that the one who is superior does the blessing. Blessing be Abraham by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. So this is what Melchizedek says. And then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. So there's the story. At the end of this great battle, the king of Salem, meaning king of peace or prince of peace, and Melchizedek, meaning king of righteousness, appears, it seems, from nowhere, bringing bread and wine. And he blesses Abram, and he gives praise to God Most High. And Abram, in response, gives Melchizedek a tenth of everything. Now we'll get to, let's go, please come with me rather, to Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 to 2. Remember some of the things that we have read so far, because this will help us understand what we're about to read here in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 to 2. For this Melchizedek, King of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, as we just read. And to him Abraham gave, or apportioned, a tenth part of everything. Now this Melchizedek is first, by translation of his name, a king of of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem. That is king of peace. We've just been reading about that at the beginning, or rather at the end of uh, Genesis chapter 14. Now Hebrews chapter 7, verses 3 to 4. Talking of Melchizedek. As we read the story, Melchizedek is without father or mother by genealogy. Of course, this is different from the Levites and from Aaron. They could trace their genealogy, but it's not mentioned in Hebrews in Genesis chapter 14. There's no reference as to the father and mother and the forefathers of Melchizedek. So he is without father or mother, having near the beginning of days, and there's no mention of the end of his life either. But, it says, resembling the Son of God, meaning 
that Melchizedek is foreshadowing Jesus. Melchizedek is like a shadow. And this whole concept of shadow becomes very relevant as we read on in the book of Hebrews. So many things shadow the ministry of Jesus Christ. And here we find that this story of Melchizedek uh, is foreshadowing Jesus. Uh, Resembling the Son of God, it says, he continues a priest forever, as we read in Psalm 110, that Melchizedek is a priest forever, or to be more exact, as it says, that the Son is appointed forever as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So, the writer of the book of Hebrews says, See how great this man was, how great Melchizedek was, to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of all the spoils. Hebrews chapter 7, and now verse 5, continuing. And those descendants of Levi, who received the priestly office, have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, through these, uh, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man, who does not have any descent from Abraham, this man who does not have his descent from them, he received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. So again, the contrast is being made here, isn't it, between the Levitical priesthood and the order of Melchizedek. It is beyond dispute, says the writer of Hebrews, it is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. And this is talking about how the inferior, that is Abram, is blessed by the superior, that is Melchizedek. I wonder what the the readers of Hebrews are thinking about at this time. Because they would have thought that Abraham is such a famous personality, but and he is, and he was. However, here is someone who is superior to Abraham. This is Amazing teaching coming from the book of Hebrews. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, talking of the Levites, but in the other case, by one who whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. So this is building up a a case of comparison and contrast, explaining how the order of Melchizedek, which never came to an end, is a superior priestly order to uh, that of Aaron and the Levites. Let's continue. Hebrews 7 verse 11. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. So he's coming up with a a proposition here. And what's he saying? If you, the readers, you, the listeners, if we think that perfection came via the Levitical priesthood, the answer is going to be, we are very much mistaken. What Because what further need would there be, would there have been for another priest to rise after the order of Melchizedek? So this is, of course, going to talk about Jesus Christ. He is the other priest who arises after the order of Melchizedek, which order predated Moses which order predated the Levitical priesthood, which order predated the giving of the law. 
and perfection did not come via the Levitical priesthood. And under that priesthood, the people received the law. If perfection had come that way, why would there be a need for another priest, is what it's saying here, to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law. And I've underlined the phrase, a change, which we see there twice, because we're about to read as we go on how there are many changes that result from this priest who arises after the order of Melchizedek. And again, the contrast continues here. The order of Aaron is contrasted to the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 7, still, verses 13 to 14. For the one of whom these things are spoken belonged to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. Fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> Once again, this is talking about Melchizedek. And at the time of Abram, as I said earlier, Abram may have thought he was the only one who was following uh, the true God, but there was someone else, Melchizedek. And he had not served at the altar as the Levitical priests would do. There was something very different about this idea. And again, it predated Moses predated the giving of the law. It goes on to say, for it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. So the, the argument is continuing. Here we have a priest, and he's going to arise from the tribe of Judah. It so happens. We know because we've studied Revelation and other scriptures, that Christ is also called the line of the tribe of Judah. Hebrews 7, now verse 15. This becomes more evident, this whole idea, when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek. Not, this other priest is not Melchizedek. This other priest is like Melchizedek. And he is after the order of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, because that was the idea of the Levitical priesthood. You had to be able to prove your lineage. Rather, but by the power of an indestructible life, referring to the resurrection. For, it is witnessed of him, again quoting from Psalm 110, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The explanation continues. Verse 18 now, and again, remember the thought of contrast. And in the book of Hebrews, we have a kind of time contrast that emerges. How things were then compared to how things are now. And of course Jesus does that, doesn't he, in Matthew uh, chapter 5 and 6. Remember Christ would say, you have heard that it was said way back then, but now I say to you. So here we find that kind of contrast. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. Very strong words. For the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, we have a better hope. And we've read this word better often, haven't we? As we have gone through the book of Hebrews so far. And we'll read of it again. There's going to be better promises, a better sacrifice, 
Jesus is more. A better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And of course this is referring to Jesus. Again, Jesus is more. Hebrews 7 verse 20. And it was not without an oath. Because remember we read in Psalm 110 uh, that God says he is saying this and it, it will never change. It was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You, talking of the Son, remember Psalm 110, Yahweh said to Adonai, said to my Lord, David's Lord, the Messiah, you are a priest forever. And this makes Jesus the guarantor, and here we have the word again in the book of Hebrews, a better covenant. Things are changing. A better hope, a better promise, uh, a better covenant. Uh, once again, Jesus is more. Hebrews 7, verse 23 to 25. Now, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. They died. The Levitical priests would die. But he, that is Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Wonderful scripture. What's it saying? You now the priest would make intercession every so often, but Jesus always lives to make intercession for us. And he can save the most extreme of us. He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to him. He is our high priest. He is our royal high priest. Let's continue in verse 26. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, talking of Jesus, holy, innocent, unstained rather, separate from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. And that's talking about what happened on uh, the Levitical Day of Atonement, and we'll talk more about that next week. Since he did this once for all when he offered up himself, there doesn't have to be multiple sacrifices anymore. Jesus has made one sacrifice for us. The many sacrifices of the priests here are contrasted to the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Verse 28. For the law appoints men in their weaknesses, or in their weakness rather, as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Another contrast here. The weakness of the human high priests contrasted to the perfection of the son. Our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So what have we been saying here in Hebrews chapter 7? If we were to have a summation of what we've talked about so far this evening. Jesus, who is the begotten incarnate Son, is this. He is the royal high priest, as foreshadowed by Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a king and a priest. He was a priestly king or a royal priest, depending on how you want to phrase it. Also, Jesus says, the royal high priest who has replaced the Levitical high priest. We'll talk more about that next week. And Jesus is the royal high priest whose ministry has replaced 
the Levitical order. This is what Hebrews chapter 7 is saying. This whole thought about this comparison between the Levitical priesthood and the order of Melchizedek and how we understand from Psalm 110 that the Messiah is appointed by God, by Yahweh, forever to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. This has some implications or consequences which we will discuss in more detail in the next few weeks. Remember we read that there was a change in the priesthood and that would bring about a change in the law. This change affects many things. There is a change in the priesthood that affects our understanding of the following ideas. And not just these ideas alone, some other related ideas, as we'll see. It changes our understanding of atonement. How is atonement given by God? There's a change in that. It also affects our understanding of the concept of covenant. And we'll see the implications of that as we continue. It affects our understanding of the idea of hope. We, in fact, have a better hope. It also affects the idea of obedience. Now that we have a a new high priest, our obedience is to him. What does that mean? And this high priest, of course, is also our king, and we obey the king, Jesus the king, who is at God's right hand. We obey him. What does that mean for us? It also affects our understanding of how we express our worship to God. And it affects our understanding of ministry. So I know we've gone through quite a bit tonight. And I just thought perhaps it would be better to explain some ideas and then just read the whole passage of Hebrews chapter 7. If you do have some questions about what we've talked about, please remember uh, to write in to us and I'll answer them personally. Uh, But thank you very much for listening to the study tonight. Uh, Next week we will be studying Hebrews chapter 8. So if you have a chance, uh, please read Hebrews chapter 8 in advance. It's only a small chapter, but it's full of ideas and full of inspiration and full of encouragement for us. So please join me next week as we look at Hebrews chapter 8. Don't forget that we have the various Zoom services, not Zoom, (laughs) Zoom services available on Saturday uh, and also uh, on Sunday, some as well. And on Sunday we have a national stream service at 11 a.m. So thank you very much for listening to me this evening. I wish you a good night. Bye-bye for now. Take care.